The beginning of the 1900s brought with it a whole new wave of black composers who went on to carve their places in musical history. Howard Swanson, the first black composer to win the impressive New York Critics Circle Award in 1952 for his short symphony, which was written in 1948. Mrs. K, a former Teaneck, New Jersey resident who was the recipient of many awards for his compositions. technician. Um, he was the most played at one period of all American composers. He was an editor at BMI, uh, Broadcast Music Incorporated of uh, uh, classical music there, and so he was in a position to make wonderful contacts, but he deserved every uh, performance he ever got because he's uh, absolutely first-rate uh, a composer, and he, he also ended up writing an opera toward late in life. Uh, very, very fine musician. In 1996, at the age of 78, George Walker became the first African-American composer to win the prestigious Pulitzer Prize. The Montclair, New Jersey concert pianist and former Rutgers professor won the award for his 1996 composition, Lilacs, a work for voice and orchestra, which was commissioned by the Boston Symphony for a tribute to Roland Hayes, the first black singer to be nationally recognized. Achieving this highly coveted prize would have seemed impossible nearly half a century ago. Even after the successful premiere of his first major concert work, Lyric for Strings, in 1947, Walker couldn't find work. It took me five years to get with the major management. <clears throat> and then when I did get with the management, uh, they found it difficult to find concerts for me because I was black. Add to that impressive list, Hale Smith, known for his merging of classical and jazz idioms. Right from the very beginning, he showed great originality, and he's had the courage to be original and to stay that way through his entire career, regardless of whether uh, someone wants to give him... He, uh, he'd have more access to performers if his music were not so uh, um, difficult, actually. And, uh, but it's well worth the time, because when you put it together, Spend the time that you need to find out what it is that he's trying to say musically, then you, uh, you have something that, and it reaches audiences uh, too. It's not inaccessible. It's just that it, a lot of hard work has to go into preparing um, a performance by Hale Smith. And Noel DaCosta. He's aware of all so many different kinds of styles. He is more accessible to the uh, casual listener, let us say the uh, uh, less sophisticated uh, listener than some others, but his music really is, it, it's, it's first rate. There are three black women who stand out for their compositions in the classical idiom. Julia Perry, Margaret Bonds, and Florence Price. Price was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, to an affluent family. She began studying music as a child, and at the age of 19, graduated from the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston with honors. Through performing, composing, and teaching, music encompassed her life, and she became the first black woman in the U.S. to achieve international prominence as a composer. This selection is titled, Fantasy Negra.
Charles and Margaret Bond's career was largely influenced by Florence Price. Bond's mother Elle was part of a circle of individuals in various artistic fields and befriended Price, even inviting her to live with them for a period. Bonds began studying piano and composition with Price, continued her musical studies, and graduated from Northwestern University at the age of 21. She became known for combining black and European idioms and created many inspirational works for both voice and instruments. And Julia Perry, like Price and Bonds, was inspired by the music of her race. Her musical pursuits began as a violinist during childhood in Akron, Ohio which she later abandoned for the piano. Perry was the recipient of numerous awards for her compositions. In 1974, a series of recordings featuring the works of black composers was produced by Columbia Masterworks titled The Black Composers Series. Under the artistic direction of Paul Freeman, this collection received overwhelming acclaim for its excellence in portraying two centuries of compositions by black composers. Centuries ago, in a society reluctant to let blacks exercise even the most basic of human rights, many were able to become highly accomplished musicians, both here and abroad. A child prodigy, George Bridgetower, was born in Poland to mixed parents. As a young violinist, he was adored by fashionable European society and royalty, eventually even residing in the household of the Prince of Wales. Later, he befriended famed composer Beethoven, who is believed to have written one of his most noted works for Bridge Tower. The violin was also the instrument to bring another into the limelight. Cuban-born Jose White traveled to Paris to study. There, his command of the instrument earned glowing reviews, as it did in the New York Times in 1875 after a performance with the New York Philharmonic. One of musical history's most incredible stories has to be that of blind pianist Thomas Green Bethune. Born in Columbus, Georgia, and commonly known as Blind Tom, Bethune showed an early aptitude for music, which was encouraged in the home of his slave master, James Bethune. Unfortunately, his slave owner began exploiting his talent from the time he was a small child. He toured throughout this country and Europe, enhancing the wealth of his slave owner who instead of granting him his freedom in 1863, when the emancipation brought it to many, maintained guardianship, passing him on like property through generations. He was said to have been able to play thousands of pieces upon request and composed over a hundred works. The most prestigious role within the symphonic world is that of the conductor because all that happens musically on stage is under his or her direction. Obtaining this most lofty position is probably the most difficult of all for blacks, yet they have, and as you will see, continue to do so. Harlem-born Dean Dixon conducted several orchestras here in the U.S., but in the late 40s, ongoing discrimination forced him to head abroad where race was less of an inhibitor to his career. In Europe, he directed several symphonies, earning him the recognition of being the first black American to conduct orchestral music full time. Everett Lee became the first to conduct a major American opera company when he led the New York City Opera for a performance in 1955. Besides his tenure as conductor with the Symphony of the New World, he too had to prove himself in Europe to earn the label of successful conductor. The New Jersey Symphony was the first symphonic orchestra to have a black music director here in the United States when it hired Henry Lewis in 1969. His career began at the age of 16 as a double bass player with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. James DePriest, a Philadelphia native, was one of the first to acquire worldwide prominence as a conductor and maintains that status today. In 1970, DePriest conducted the National Symphony in Constitution Hall on the very stage, his aunt, world-renowned singer Marian Anderson, 
had been refused the opportunity to perform in 1939 by the Daughters of the American Revolution because of her skin color. And Paul Freeman. I was walking through Prague a few years ago, and when it was still, you had to have a special visa and everything. And um, I heard, coming from the window, a group of kids singing We Shall Overcome in English, uh, Czechs, well accented. I mean, but it w I, I found it rather charming. But uh, and then shortly thereafter, <laughs> Paul Freeman should become the, uh, uh, the conductor and musical director of the Czech, uh, of the National Philharmonic is really uh, quite something. We're going to pause for a short break, but when we continue, we'll talk about the first truly integrated orchestra.